All right, welcome back. We are INFR 2350 Intermediate Computer Graphics in the winter 2021 semester at Ontario Tech University, and it's week four, part one of our broadcast. We're talking about full screen effects and post processing today. That is the topic. I'm also going to talk about a bunch of other stuff, so hang tight as we get to that. Um, again, I'm going to try and get through most of these slides. We have a lot of things planned today, and very little time as always. We only have enough, about 90 minutes to get everything done in the time that we have. So let's get going. First thing we're sitting at week four. And again, we're talking about full screen effects and post processing. And we have in class exercise two that has been released today. It should be available to now on Canvas. Um, and what that is, is um, it's going to ask you to do a little shader toy exercise again. I think it's neat to go into shader toy and, and bounce around with. Uh, you know, the options are there are two options for the in class exercise that you'll be allowed to do. One option is uh, a tune slash cell shader, and the other one is um, color correction. And there's some examples that I put in the PowerPoint to guide you as well. I'll, I'll, I can uh, kind of guide you. It's worth again two and a half percent of your final grade. It's due on, I believe, Friday. Um, but you can probably get it done and a lot sooner than that if you follow along now or if you go up on uh, Shader Toy and experiment uh, while we're talking. While you're watching this and when I'm talking about full screen effects, you can get that done uh, because we have that kind of capability. So that is uh, where we're at today. Um, notice next week we have this midterm uh, test uh, that is scheduled. There's no lecture officially next week. So we're still meeting during this time from 11 to 1230 next Wednesday, but there's no lecture material next week at all. All right. And, and why? Because I'm giving you your time to do your, uh, your practical test. The test will be basically going over everything we've learned to date. So that means assignment one and assignment two are really training you to do your to do well on your midterm test. It's a practical test. So there's no true false multiple choice or anything like that. It's uh, you'll have a um, a template to start with. Again, you can use Otter as a template or any other of the assignments that you have as a template to start. And I will ask you for to produce something uh, based on um, you know the framework that we've given you, the assignment framework. Okay, so that is What's happening? You'll have all week to do it. I'll probably release it early around Monday, um, you know, worst case Tuesday, and you'll have it all the way until Saturday or Sunday. And I'll give you the details of that in an announcement that'll be um, that'll come out early in the week. All right. So you'll have all week to do it. Um, again, you know, please make sure you take care of it. It's I think it's worth 10% of your final grade. So um, you know, I think it's nothing to uh, to ignore. Um, please don't forget to do it because it'll close promptly on the day that it's due. There won't be an extension or if you're late or anything like that, it's a test. So whatever day it's due, if it's due Saturday at midnight or Sunday or Friday at midnight or whatever it's going to be due, uh, based on what Nicholas, Nicholas and I uh, discuss, then that'll be the closing date for you. And this will be a little bit different than we do our assignments. Assignments, you know, if you're late, um, we still, we don't want to accept them late, but we will because we know that there's extraneous circumstances that occur. But with uh, tests, uh, tests are kind of a little bit more strict. So that's what's happening there. I'm also releasing assignment three. Uh, that's been released today. And it's due week seven. So if you look at week seven, that is, uh, you know, deep into March. So we're looking at about a month away uh, for assignment three. Um, and this is also taking into account the reading week that's happening between uh, February 16th and 21st. So that is taking into that account as well. So officially, it's we're sitting at week four. It's only really three uh, you know, learning weeks away, right, as an example, but it's actually four weeks away in terms of real time, okay? So that's when it's due. It's gonna be due week seven. On, on And I made it due on the Sunday, so you have plenty of time uh, to get it uh, done. I'm also gonna release assignment four at that time, which is the last assignment. Assignment four is also weighted the heaviest because um, it's kind of a culminating assignment of all the things that you've got that you've kind of learned, um, you know, during uh, the course of the semester. Right. So that and it's due pretty much near the end of semester assignment four. All right. So that is, uh, you know, the schedule we're, we're talking about today is full screen effects and post processing. Again, your ICE two in class exercise number two is due uh, on Friday. Assignment two, uh, 
you know, is due this week on Sunday. That's the due date. Remember that you should be forming groups of two to three. And it's with assignment groups for uh, assignment two, right? So again, if I go up on, if I go up on Canvas, and if I quickly look at uh, people, and I'm just going to take this off screen for a second so that you don't see just by chance your names. And if I go to assignment groups, just for a second, I'll bring it right back. And you can see that assignment groups, uh, some people still haven't registered for assignment groups. Please register for assignment groups if you don't then um, you can't submit, all right? So that's what I'd ask you guys to do as much as possible. I'm just gonna bring that off screen again. Um, so please uh, make sure you do that um, as soon as you can because it's, an, it's a group assignment for, um, for assignment two, okay? So if you don't do it, you can't submit uh, for assignment two. And it's the same thing. There's also assignment groups for, um, for assignment three, and it's a different group set. Why? Because this way, if you want to mix and match, this is what we talked about before, then you'll be allowed to mix and match in the other group set. I just want to talk about briefly of what's going to be due for assignment three so that it's recorded here. Uh, this is the first thing that I'm going to be talking about. So assignment three is worth seven seven and a half percent of your final grade. Um, there is still going to be a project slash GW related base, which is worth 20 marks. And then you're going to build something called a G buffer, which we're going to be talking a little bit about today. You should know or have heard at this at this point what a G buffer is. But if you don't know what it is, um, basically what you're going to put together is a series of FBOs that are going to give you um, position information, depth information, normal information. And what you're going to do is you're going to compose a full screen quad. That's what's going to happen. And the full screen quad is going to um, mix or, uh, or blend uh, all of these different uh, frame buffer objects together into kind of one uh, effect. And that's where you can use, you can finally do your post processing effects. Uh, you'll be asked to do a G buffer, which is 30 points. And then you're going to get into post processing effects. I'm going to ask you to do three post processing effects of your choice. So you can choose cell tune shading, which is kind of something that we're talking about today, a motion blur, a pixelation, a bloom shading, film grain, night vision. If you have another idea, you can also propose another kind of shader idea that makes sense, if it makes sense. Um, if you shoot a note to your uh, TA or to myself, if I've approved it, then you can add in something else that makes sense. For each of the post-processing effects, they'll be worth 10 marks out of 100. Uh, six of those will be up on visual appeal, how it finally looks, and four of them will be on the implementation efficiency and how it, um, how it works in your code. All right, so, and it says the post-processing effects must be toggled individually. So that's like number two. So G buffer, first uh, the, your, your base, then your G buffer, then your post-processing effects, and finally debug keys. So um, in your debug keys, there's only five of them here. One is show the scene composited with one deferred light source, two, you're, I want to show your um, uh, your uh, you know position depth buffer, the normal, the color buffer, as well as the accumulation buffer. One thing that I don't have in here is for your uh, post processing effects, right? As an example, and I'm going to leave it to you. And I think I could have put a note that says you know add in additional keys for your post processing effects, but I'm going to leave it to you to put additional controls so that you can show off, uh, toggle on and toggle off your post-processing effects as it says uh, right here. So I'm not gonna assign a key to it. You kind of assign keys on your own to make sure that um, you can show the effects of your, uh, your post-processing effects, whatever it is that you've chosen, all right? Um, of course, you're gonna make a demo video like normal, and then you're going to submit your a link to your GitHub repository and a video a video link a working video link to your five minute presentation. Again, some people have asked really weird questions like uh, the slide deck. Do I have to submit the slide deck? And the answer is no. Um, Andrew asks, can we use two of the post processing effects we did in the tutorial? Yeah, as long as you can make it work with your GW game, I'm okay with that. That's the idea. It's trying to reuse and, and kind of work with those things and, and enhance what you've got. I'm totally fine with you doing the same thing. Totally fine with it. Okay. And, and the reason for this is because you're going to be working with the post-processing effects that you're going to actually have at the end. So for the non-GDW students, 
That's why I put this this uh, assignment together for you as well, because remember, you don't really have a game. So this is going to get you to add those post-processing effects ahead of time so that by the time you get to your final project, you've, you've been able to build up uh, everything you need so you can be successful. So you don't need an extra assignment, as an example. Okay, that's the idea. So this is why I've given you this, this opportunity. All right. Um, so demo video, and then you're going to submit. And then I put the kind of a simple rubric down here, which I'm going to fill in eventually. All right, so that is uh, the assignment three um, information. It's up on Canvas. So please, if you have questions, or always refer to your document if, uh, if you have questions around it. And please connect with your TA or myself if you have uh, specific questions around um, your assignment that's going to be due. Again, this is due way out March 7th, um, you know, 2021. That's a Sunday. Uh, as an example, at midnight, so lots of time to uh, to get this one done, and it's going to lead into assignment four, which is going to basically bounce off of assignment three. So it's going to be like a you know you're going to assignment four, you need a working assignment three uh, for you to get it done. Okay, are we allowed to use assignment one as a base for assignment two, uh, even if we are GDW? Uh, no, no, no. Typically, what I'd like you to do if you're GDW is use your GDW game. Right. So the idea is that you're going to apply assignment to if you're if you're a GDW student, your mandate is to take your GDW game, your scene that you have currently. Right. And add the effects that we've asked you to add in uh, for assignment two. If you're a non GDW student, it's OK for you to use assignment one because you don't have a game. Right. So that's where non GDW students have a little bit of some leeway, but they're going to be you know, they're going to have a tough time putting something together that's gamified. Uh, for their GDW pro project at the end. So that's why it's good to build up from one assignment to the next. Okay, so please read the, the assignment carefully. If you're a GDW student, you need to use your GDW game. Okay. All right, so that is um, uh, this part. So again, we've talked about a couple things so far, and I, I spent a little bit of time of our lecture material talking about it only because I want to make sure that you're clear. So re recap, ICE 2 is released and is due uh, Friday at midnight. Assignment two is due Sunday at midnight. Assignment three has been released and is due week seven. That's March 7th, Sunday, March 7th at midnight. Okay. Tutorial that's coming up on the weekend on, on Friday. Uh, well, yeah, I'm sorry, but I mean, you could do it today if you really want to. Uh, you know, the shader toy stuff is, you know, pretty straightforward to do. I've given you extra days just so that way you don't have to wait until Friday to get it done, right? Because really you're just experimenting with Shader Toy. That's all I've got you uh, to do. Um, so it, it should be straightforward. So that is uh, when it's all due. And again, next week, remember that there is a practical test that I'm going to release early in the week, again, as a recap, and you're going to have uh, to complete by near the end of the week, either, either Friday or Saturday. Chances are I'm going to make it towards the Saturday, only because I want to give you as much time as possible um, to be successful as you go into, uh, you know, a reading week. Okay, so that's what the plan is. Any questions about the plan and uh, all the stuff that's due before we move on to the lecture content? I'm going to whiz through this next part because we have 58 slides and there's only, uh, there's less than an hour left. Alan says, if you're using GDW game, is it still max of three people per group? Yes. So what you're doing is like, just like in assignment two, what you're doing is you're choosing some, uh, some of your members from your GDW. And that's why I've given you a chance to, to have um, a group set for assignment two and a group set for assignment three. So it's two to three members from your GDW game. You're going to split up and you're going to say, okay, half the team is going to go and, and work on this, uh, on the assignment together. And the other half the team is going to work on, on the assignment as well. And then the, uh, the hope is that you're going to be able to get together um, after you've had some good results and take the best of those results for your project, your final project that you're going to submit for your GDW. That's the idea behind it. You can have the exact same base. For GDW members, it's the great thing about this for you. You can use the exact same base uh, for, your, uh, you know, for your project. If you're a non-GDW team, and I know there's one group of four or five, again, it'll be the same rules for you. You can split up into uh, groups of two to three, and then you're good to go. All right, so that's the structure behind it. Um, yeah, you could do that, Aim. I'm fine with that. If you wanted to do uh, local copies, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. 
as long as it makes sense. Uh, and it's, it's, you use the same base, but your effects and your project is separate. I'm fine with that. Again, I'm, I'm looking for, um, you know, uh, to, to see actual visible differences between, uh, let's say, one group and another. Even though you're the same GDW team, you should be able to produce something that's different. Okay, so, and of course the videos will be different because you're gonna be talking about uh, your um, your effects and everything else you're doing in the video, right? So, okay, so hopefully that answers your questions about assignment uh, two and assignment three, they're the same. Assignment two and three is your groups of two to three. Please, if you haven't a chance to sign up already for groups, you cannot submit your assignment two or three without signing up for a group. And there's also another group set for assignment four. You know, you might want to think about this ahead of time and sign up. It could be the same team. It could be that you want to mix up. You want to do, um, you know, out of the five or six people that are in your GDW team, you want to be fair and, you know, kind of uh, mix it up between one assignment and the other. Maybe you have a preference to work with certain people in the team uh, or you want to mix it between um, programmers and people who are whose programming is not a, a first love. If you're a technical artist or if you're a producer as a first love and you're you might want to combine with the programmer from your team to be more successful and that's the idea okay let's move on now to the lecture content uh sorry one more question fardine says do both people need to be speaking in the demo video when we are in a group no i don't require that uh, one person can present for the team i'm fine with that um but i'd like to see uh commits let's say on github those kind of things to prove that the other members are also valuable. Okay, let's move on to, I need to move on now to, um, to post-processing. So when we talk about post-processing, um, exactly what it sounds like, it happens you know, later on inside of the render pipeline. So we have our, we kind of go through the render pipeline, we go through the vertex uh, you know, shader, uh, we go through the geometry shaders, we do through all those things, go through the, the, uh, the rasterizer, we come up the other end, uh, where we do all the assembly and everything else, uh, and we do our uh, our fragment shader, and finally we create our FBOs. And after the FBOs, we have this post-processing step, and usually we do a series of post-processing passes uh, that we, we perform where we do uh, some kind of effect. And the way to do this, and we're going to see later on as we talk throughout this, um, uh, this lecture, is we create something called a full-screen quad, a full-screen quad, and we use that as a render target for our texture. We're going to create a uh, you know, texture in memory. That's really what we're doing. And we're spitting it out into a full screen quad. And so the, all the post-processing happens off screen. So we do off screen post-processing, and then we render everything to this full screen quad. That is in essence what post-processing at a very high level is all about. Okay. Of course, we need to use uh, 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 several, one or more frame buffer objects, of course, in order for us to do this. And a frame buffer object, if you think about it, is just a, an array of data that we're going to kind of put together. All right, so how does this look? So here's the typical flow. We, we bind some kind of frame buffer. We render the game as normal. We blit the frame buffer to some kind of, uh, to a normal frame buffer. We unbind it, so we flip it, uh, you know, from one frame buffer to the other. Um, as an example, and then we render everything to a full screen quad. That's the screen size quad, which is basically in uh, normalized screen space uh, coordinates. All right, so that's what we do. So in screen space, we've got this full screen quad, and then it looks, we can basically render our scene in here. And this happens every frame. Okay, so now you might say, when, it, when I first looked at this, when I was learning it, I was like, wait, what? We're actually going to render stuff offline and blit this out to the screen pretty much we're going to you know swap buffers every single frame into a full screen quad how can that be performant this idea right and we're going to see that there's advantages and disadvantages of this so where to use this is also um this process this idea of the typical flow from us to do post processing requires right another step it requires us to uh to do something uh almost like a deferred rendering in some ways, right? Because it kind of re deferred rendering and post-processing kind of go hand in hand, right? Because uh, for us to do post-processing with forward rendering, it can be done, but it's it's more challenging than it is if we're using deferred rendering. And then I mean, these are different things that we're talking about. There's something also different when we talk about deferred rendering, it's something that happens later, deferred, as opposed to right away, okay? 
So that's kind of the, the, the way to remember that when we talk about deferred rendering. Um, <clears throat> this idea of ping pong texturing, where we basically uh, are going to swap between, we're ping ponging between one frame buffer object and another uh, to produce a, a texture is also something that is can be used to create a multiple post-processing effects. There, moving on. So let's talk about FBOs a little bit. Really, at the end of the day, um, you know, the final destination for OpenGL, and like I just said earlier, is the frame buffer object. All right. And what we do is we have a collection of 2D arrays, frame buffers. And what we do is we take things like color buffers, depth buffers, stencil buffers, and accumulation buffers, and we put them all together. Andrew says, can we use the frame buffer we made in tutorial? <clears throat> Absolutely. Actually, you know what? That's what tutorials are for. Uh, just cutting out to, to what I've been asked. It's super important that you attend tutorials because if you think about what Nick is doing for you uh, in tutorials, he's trying to set you up to be successful with everything else we're doing. All the code that we're sharing with you, unless Nick otherwise says so, if we say something like you can't use our code or something like that, um, the idea is that you can use our code. You take the code that we've given you as a sample, right? And you would obviously expand that code uh, to make it relevant for the project that you're working on, specifically for your game in assignment two, three, and four. All right, so here's some examples of some FBOs, an image, again, a single 2D array of pixels, that's an FBO, layered images, textures, render buffers, and some kind of object that I want to attach, uh, you know, uh, to another object, okay? So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. How do we create an FBO? What we wanna do is, so here's how we know that a, a frame buffer is generally complete. If at least one buffer has been attached. So we can actually add something called um, attachments. And those attachments are just generally anything that we want to connect to the frame buffer, right? So I can have a color attachment, a depth attachment, a stencil attachment, and so on, all right? So at least one buffer has been attached. That's, this is, these are the cases for how do we know if a frame buffer is complete. Next is there must be at least one color attachment uh, for OpenGL 4.1 and earlier uh, to make sure this works. All attachments are complete. So for example, a texture attachment needs to have memory reserved. You have to always already have uh, used the, uh, you know, again, it could be uh, a pointer to the memory that you've uh, you've allocated on the heap as an example. And again, there's a difference between heap memory and stack memory, and you guys should know the difference at this point. Um, and then, you know, all attachments must have the same number of multi-samples. So there's a number that you're gonna get there, which is the multi-sample number. You need to have the same, it's got to be structured the same way or else it's going to be out of sync with everything else. Okay, so let's, let's continue. Um, so again, uh, we just put in some code here in terms of uh, the functions that you need, the GL functions, GL gen frame buffers that generates it and delete it. Um, we can read the frame buffer and draw the buffer uh, is how we do it, those things. And again, there are two types of frame buffer attachable images, either texture images or render buffer images. So one or the other. And if an image is a render buffer, it's usually attached to the frame buffer directly. And then what we do is we do some off-screen rendering, which is what I talked about before with the post-processing effects. So we do this off-screen rendering, right? We, we, um, we um, you know, kind of compose the, um, the, the image what we want to show in our full-screen quad off-screen. And then we you send it to the full-screen quad uh, we kind of, you know, flip it so we can show it every frame. But we're going to do that, um, that post-process. We're going to apply the effects of the post-process every single frame. And the only way that can be done is on the GPU. That's why when I first learned it, I was like, what? Wait, what? All those calculations? We're going to do all that stuff and it's going to be done? How is that possible? It's GPU side, guys. And that's how it's possible because the GPU can handle it. All right. So, again, um, we're just still looking at the process of creating it. Um, of the frame buffer object. Again, uh, when, we, when, we, when we see this, we have some kind of texture image. We're going to put it on an attachment. Notice that there might be several attachments. For example, uh, attachment 0, 1, 2, 3. This, these are usually handles. You can also use an enumeration for these things. A lot of times what I use is an enum to uh, kind of indicate um, color attachment 0, 1, 2, 3 to give myself a little bit more um, you know, again, information. And usually there's built-in enumerations like GL depth attachment, GL stencil attachment. These are enumerations that are built in uh, to OpenGL to give, you know, to give the information 
um, as an example to the frame buffer of what type of um, what uh, what we're attaching to it. Okay, that's what it is. Again, there's two types. Here's the texture image attachment, and here's the render buffer attachment. There's different kinds of attachments that we have here. In the case of the texture object, we're going to specify a uh, color attachment 0 or 1, and in or whatever to n. And then the in terms of the render buffer, we're going to attach a specifically, we're going to indicate a specific enumeration that's built in. Dep, stencil, whatever. Okay. So that is how it works. Um, so really the main goal is um, the post-processing of rendered images and what we said earlier, which is the composition between different scenes. So what I want to do is I want to compose the image uh, based on any of the special effects or uh, something that I'm going to I'm going to apply to the texture, an off-screen texture. I'm going to apply the effects and then I'm going to I'm going to send it to the screen. The great advantages to this and some of the great advantages to uh, to what we're doing is control. There's also disadvantages to this this methodology. Um, one problem that we have with any kind of full screen quad and deferred rendering that I'm going to talk about is uh, transparency. It's very challenging to do transparency uh, with the full screen quad and deferred rendering or shading, which we're going to talk about soon. If I'm going to go there, I'd rather use forward rendering. So, and we're going to talk about when to use deferred rendering over forward rendering. And these are just two two techniques. There's no magic bullet when it comes to what you want to do in your scene, and sometimes you got to use more than one technique uh, depending on the frame that you're you're uh, uh, you're going to be rendering. Okay, so we're going to talk about or the scene that you're going to be rendering. Here's some example of some code. I'm not going to go into the code. This is for your reference so that you can see uh, a typical um, how to create a frame buffer object. Um, this is what it might look like in code. Okay, so this is just for you for for you to use. Again, so there's uh, two main uses for frame buffer objects: multi-pass rendering, such as deferred shading. Okay, deferred shading or rendering. Um, FBO store intermediate geometry in something called a geometry buffer or a G buffer, which is something that you're creating for assignment three, um, and it includes things like normals, position, depth, and what they do is they compose all those things together into a pass, a rendering pass. You can have several passes that you use in your deferred uh, pipeline. And what you want to do there is you can add different kinds of effects in each pass. For example, a blur pass, you know, a some kind of uh, other kind of pass that you want to do. And you do several passes until you get uh, the effect that you're looking for in the final version of your full screen that's going to be rendered on your full screen quad. The other reason why you want to use a uh, frame buffer object or a frame buffer object in general is some kind of general purpose computing, uh, for example, machine learning uh, or anything like that that you're going to use. You can render a lot of the stuff on offline. You can actually use it instead of rendering, but to do some calculations. And you can use a frame buffer object for that because it's just data at the end of the day that you're playing with. So when we do post-processing with FBOs, there's a series of slides here. Um, if you think about this, we do the first pass, which is we want to draw FBO number one. These passes are done, again, off screen. So you do all these passes. So the first pass, you draw your FBO. What you do is you attach your different attachments, your color attachments. You might attach um, your textures and so on. You're going to add in um, the second pass. You're going to read FBO one, right? As an example, you're going to uh, draw FBO numbers two and three, as an example. And you're going to most likely layer or uh, mix the two three or compose um, your final scene with using FBO one, two, and three together in terms of what you're going to come up with at the end. So that's kind of the uh, the structure that you're going to come up with. And at the end, you might have a final pass as an example where you read in uh, you know uh, FBO one, two, and three, and then that is going to be your your fourth pass where you're going to actually render that pass uh, to the full screen plot. Okay, and here's an example of where you can actually have um, a two screen, a two pass rendering algorithm where you have, let's say, pass one, you draw your FBO number one, you attach a some kind of texture with desaturated color. Attachment two will be a texture with inverse color, and attachment three would be a texture with grayscale. Uh, and then what you want to do is compose all those things together, kind of layer them together, and whap, you have pass number two, which is reading in. 
everything that you got in from, um, from all those pieces. You're going to read each of the attachments from the FBO, number one, and you're going to render it in the second pass. When you put them, well, the second pass is really a compositional pass that puts everything together, all right, is what happens. And here's an example of something like that, where you have your texture input, and then you have several passments. Here's your attachments, one, two, and three. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take that uh, first pass, and then you're going to read all the attachments from, uh, from FBO number one, and you're going to read it in FBO number two. When your second pass, you're going to compose everything into your final product, whatever that might look like, okay, where you kind of compose everything in one. All right, so that is uh, post-processing at a glance, at a very high level, and we use FBOs for that. And so your assignment number three, right, uh, is going to be using FBOs for the purpose of post-processing, all right? So why is it really cool? Um, well, we can improve real-time lighting. This is really great. Um, so here's the advantage. Single pass, you know, uh, we have some hidden surfaces that can cause some wasted shading, hard to manage, uh, a lot of multi-light. So for example, if I have a single pass, we're doing, you know, forward rendering as a good example. We have no, uh, you know, we might be doing uh, the same thing that we would do in forward rendering with a single pass. Multi-pass, we have, um, again, some problems with hidden surfaces, as an example, um, because we have some repeated work. But when we actually do deferred rendering or shading, so we actually do it off screen, and then we bring it in and we um, re render it to a full screen quad, what we do is we compose the scene so all the pixels that we want have the values that we want at the end. We don't have to waste uh, cycles uh, trying to compose things and have objects that are hidden that uh, we have to calculate. Uh, we don't have to do any of those things because we're doing it off screen and we can we don't have to use render time to do that we can do that in uh compute time which is on the gpu okay so this is something that we want to do um so this is why it's good many lights if i want to do deferred rendering or deferred shading it's a good idea to use uh to use something like that because remember with forward rendering we're going to have a light limitation probably something like four lights like you know realistically depending on your gpu Maybe eight if you have a really great GPU uh, and, um, you know, that kind of thing. But if you have many lights, 200 lights, 300 lights, 500 lights, then you want to use a deferred pass, a deferred rendering uh, process, which means you're going to do some kind of post-processing effects to create the lights in your scene. All right, so that's kind of something that uh, is a reason for that. Where it's bad, like we talked about before, is it's not great with uh, some kind of transparency. Transparencies. You know, it, we have to work really, really hard to make, um, you know, the deferred pass work properly with transparencies. Why? Because there's a lot of issues. Transparency is actually a problem that's difficult to solve. Um, where it's really great is you can layer things like shadows. So shadow mapping and all that kind of stuff, it makes a lot of sense to, uh, you know, to use shadow mapping in a, as, a, as a deferred step or a post-processing effect. Why? Because I can add shadows. Uh, to my texture in layers, right? And I can also do things like, like we're going to talk about later on, cascading shadow maps, which is something that where a map that's closer uh, up to our screen, as an example, has really good resolution, but a shadow that's really, really far away has very little resolution because we're not going to see it anyway. So those are the things that we can do with post-processing effects. So, um, one of the things that we can also do um, when, we, when we're talking about post-processing is things like smoothing. Let's talk about smoothing and surface normals a little bit. One thing we can do is there's, there's different ways we can use smoothing. We can smooth, we can do per face smoothing, per vertex smoothing, and per pixel smoothing. Okay, so those three different kinds of smoothing we can, we can apply. Um, again, obviously what we want to do is per pixel smoothing, all right? And it really depends on the kind of light that we want. Obviously this uh, for important lights would be a much more higher, uh, much more work that would have to be done per pixel as opposed to per vertex and per face. Per face, as an example, not great. You can actually see the faces uh, you know, on an object. If it's something that's far away, it's okay. But if you bring something like this object close up, not great. Something in the middle distance, you know, as an example, that's not important. And if you're lighting, if you're lighting an object that is some kind of hard surface, then per vertex might be okay. But something close up, like a face, 
or something that needs a lot of detail per pixel is where you want to go. And you want to change the algorithm that you're going to use depending on uh, the situation. Um, we're going to move into uh, something that we're going to be talking about. Uh, so tune or cell shading uh, was a... <clears throat> yeah, I would agree, uh, Leo. Uh, I would say that cell shading and tune shading is... is it creates a non-realistic effect. It's been made popular by games like Borderlands uh, and other things out there uh, now. Um, it creates a very cartoony look. And the, the term cell came from the original cells that were used by animators. They were, you know, kind of, um, you know, the celluloid sheets that were hand-drawn. That's where it comes from. And it creates this non-photorealistic -photo rendering effect or NPR effect, right? So anime games, absolutely, Jonathan, they use them a lot. I think it creates a really cool looking effect, but it's a shader. It's something that we can use um, to do in, uh, to add um, as an effect after the fact. So one of the things that I've asked you guys to do in in-class exercise number two is take a look at Shader Toy. We're going to see a couple of examples here. And I want you to thicken the, um, you know, kind of the, uh, the outline. Because one of the things we want to do is we want to do some, um, you know, kind of uh, outline detection. We're going to talk about that in a second. So this is how we can do the tune or cell shading process. We start with some regular 3D model, right? Could be whatever it is. We apply a couple of rendering tricks. One of them is we want to find, we want to use something called edge detection. You know, we want to kind of we look at the outline. So we do the edge detection and then we apply uh, thicker edges is what we want to do. Right? That's the that's what we want to kind of do, the next part. That's number one. So we silhouette the edges, right? Uh, depending on how thick the edge uh, you know, is, it can have a different also a different effect. And a lot of uh, comic book looking um, you know, uh, effects that we might see in, in certain games or whatever, uh, we might have thicker or thinner edges. Sometimes also we want to use um, edge tracing or something like that, especially when we're looking at objects that are far away. Whether or not we use uh, tune or cell shading, um, finding using edge detection might be a great way of outlining an object, especially if we're doing something like selection. Let's say, for example, I'm selecting an object, um, you know, with some kind of selection, and you know, like I want to select an object with my mouse, and um, I want to highlight that object when I select it. We can use edge detection uh, for that, and we can draw a, a nice um, uh, kind of effect. Um, you know, a glow effect as an example that goes around the object that allows the user to see it a lot easier. So that we can do it, and there's different reasons to, reason to do uh, silhouette or edge detection. The next part is um, discretized shading, all right? Which is what you want to do is you want to smooth the lighting values, uh, and it's calculated per pixel, and then map to a small number of discrete shades. So instead of, notice that there are different uh, layers and you would use, depending on uh, the geometry, the position of the geometry in the scene, you would have these breakpoints. That's what you're gonna do. You're gonna create breakpoints where you're gonna show a very discrete looking area of different colors. So color is gonna be darker here, a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter, and then really light over here. And it's gonna be based on the position of the object, right, relative to the light, right? So, um, and that's how it would work. Okay, so that kind of creates this, you know, tune shading or cell shading effect. Okay, so that's the process. Here's an example of what it would look like if we have a diffuse and specular lighting that's on here compared to our tune shading with the same mesh over here. Notice that there is a continuous function here for diffuse and specular, and there is a step function here for the tune shading um, effect that you want. Again, we're going to use this idea is giving us the idea of this silhouette edge detection, all right, which is what we're doing. So edge detection is the first step. Um, and then what we do is we want to clamp the lighting uh, based on the angle, like I said. And typically what we want to do is uh, we can clamp it between um, whatever the, the angle is. We're going to clamp the, the type of lighting and the color, right, so we can create the effect that we want. And so we get this this idea where we have um, there's other ways to to draw the edges. 
what we can do first is in a post-processing step, first we have the basic mesh, then we do the edge detection, and then finally we do, um, you know, kind of the, um, the color that we add in based on the breakpoints that you see, depending on the angle that the object is being shown in. And I'm saying breakpoints, uh, there's this discrete, basically, colors that are put in. That's why it's discretized, uh, you know, kind of uh, shading that we're using here. All right, so this is your in-class exercise uh, sample number one. If you guys go to, um, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat here. Do we need to use, do we need complex meshes to get the outline working? I remember having trouble getting it visible in lower poly models. Um, well, I think it makes it easier if, um, you know, if the model is, uh, the more primitive a model is, then obviously the easier it is to get it done. Um, you don't, the more, um, and it's true, I think what you're, what you're asking is if you have more vertices, right, that, or more a higher poly model, then it's going to be easier for us to get those discrete breakpoints. Yes, that is true. From a color perspective, again, I think a higher quality model will help. But again, you have to balance that between uh, the color model and, um, you know, kind of your, your, um, your poly budget for your, the game that you're making, right? So you might have a, a, a polygon budget of 5,000 polygons, as an example, um, in a small game because of performance issues. So you still want to match that while you're still doing shading. So the answer is yes. Um, so let's take a look at this one. This is one of the options for in-class exercise two. All right, so let me bring that up here for a second. And so I can show you what this would look like. So this is one of them. And there's two. So it's already up there. So what you can do is you can take a look at this and you can look at other ones. I've just presented this one for you. So um, you can go there and modify some of the objects. What you have here is there's two objects that are kind of linked together. One of them is a torus and the other one is a, uh, a cube, what you see here, right? So that's what you have. You have a torus and a cube and they're meshed together. And what you can do is you have a, um, and here's where they look like, here's your SD torus and your SD box. That's, that, that's what defines, those two functions define the torus and the box. And what they do is they mesh them together um, as an example. Um, and here they use uh, marching, remarching, in order for you to do what you have to do. So that's what uh, happens over here. This is an example. You can use anything you want to for in-class exercise uh, to modify. What I'm looking for for the in-class exercises See if you can thicken the edges. So edge detection, thicken the edges so that it looks even thicker than this, right? As an example, see what you can do with the bevel, change the color, modify the objects. See if you can do some, some of those kind of things here. And here's some examples of how this is done. Look, you can look at other objects online or other examples of tune or cell shading that you can use for your in-class exercise. So very simple. You wanna take a before and after shot like before for in, your in-class exercise to get full marks. No, Andrew, no, no, no. I would never make you do that, right? So that would be, um, you know, that would be really torture. I don't want, I don't want you to make it by hand. Um, I want you to look at examples online and modify them. I think that's the easiest way to go about it. And there's a lot of learning there uh, when it comes to, to look at that. Yeah, don't be scared. Two and a half percent is going to be nice and easy for you guys to get if you just follow along by taking a, something that exists today and, and, uh, and modifying it. So this is one of the options that we have, uh, you know, kind of for your in-class exercise, this one. All right. Um, all right. So that is it for uh, tune and cell shading. And that's one of the options that I asked you guys for. Uh, no, it's not. It's not hard at all uh, for edge detection. Um, and that's what I'm going to ask you guys to do for one of the options. And I highly recommend this one since we're talking about it. And maybe, you know, um, our friend Nick is probably going to talk about tune cell shading as well. Right. It, one of the options that you can add in for your assignment three. And for your final project, for your game, depending on if this makes sense. Um, you could also just say, you know, um, you can add another effect as well, not just tune shading. And sometimes it makes sense uh, for this kind of thing. Um, I've seen everything from flashbacks, uh, flashback sequences, even for more, um, I would say, uh, modern games. You have a modern game that has a different kind of uh, shading effect on the main characters. But when they do a flashback sequence, they use cell shading to kind of indicate that they're in a flashback, you know, so I've seen stuff like that as well. I, I want to talk about which game it is. I can't remember, but I've seen it. All right. And um, let's move on to color grading or correction, which is what you're going to be doing for assignment two. We're going to talk about this a little bit.
All right, so again, you need it's post-processing that we need to do. So why? Because you have your original texture, and what you want to do with your original texture is you want to you want to change the color values, right? According to um, to make it either uh, either warmer or cooler. This is kind of the basics. And so you can see here in this image, and with this the same image that I saw when I first learned uh, about color grading and correction. Um, what you want to do is you want to take a sample of the image and create something called a lookup table, a 3D lookup table. All right. These um, 3D lookup tables that we're going to be talking about are called LUTs, uh, lookup tables. And this is what um, Nicholas is going to help you out with in the next tutorial. So please make sure you watch the next tutorial, which is, uh, I think, key to your success for assignment number two. All right. So again, when we talk about warm and cooler colors, again, for people who don't know about a little bit about color theory, let's talk a little bit about color theory. So one of the things that we want to think about is what num what colors are considered warmer? Obviously, orange, red, and yellow. We can think of them as more fiery colors. So those are the warmer the colors on the warmer side of the spectrum, and the cooler colors are on the other side of this divide, which are you know the the greens, the blues, and the purple colors, the light purple colors that give us kind of this cool effect where we can use the warm colors to warm things up or things like you want to give a, a feeling of a summer day or even a fall day, you know, very kind of tinted towards the red spectrum. Um, even a sepia kind of, um, you know, look and feel to it, then you want to use kind of a warmer color uh, grading is what you want to do. Or if you want to make it so it's more like a wintry day or you want to make it so that you're looking at the sky or and you want to whitewash the colors because you have an effect, uh, an emotion that you want to convey, then you can, again, um, you know, uh, convey it with cooler colors. Sometimes what we say is that warmer colors are happier, give you happier feelings, and cooler colors give you kind of sadder feelings or uh, feelings of um, melancholy. All right. So depending on how you look at it, you can apply colors to really give the effect that you want in the game. And here's an example of um, some different colors. The same scene, and again, if you zoom in here, um, it's pretty cool what you can do. You can see that it's the same scene here. Oops. The same scene with different color grading. So here you can see that it can look, this same scene that looks really beautiful and nice and serene can look pretty scary with when it's a little bit fiery. So a way warmer color, a fiery color, not just warm. And it can look, um, same scene. We can highlight certain elements in the scene by making it look cooler and darker. Um, again, as an example, um, we can also uh, create other effects where you can see the sun in the background in a different space. Take a look at that one compared to this one where we see the god rays come through here in the scene as an example. Um, so there's different ways of grading the color to create a different look and feel of the scene, right? Some, uh, you know, this is, again, this would be something like sunrise, and this can be kind of the middle of the day. You can do that kind of stuff. And I think it's really, uh, it's really a really crazy effect that you can get pull off with some, it's not that difficult to do. The film industry uses it a lot and so do games to enhance the atmosphere, to create a, you know, a look and feel uh, for the particular scene that you're looking at. So really kind of quite cool what you can do. Uh, there's an article that is an excellent read that I recommend. And if you go to this uh, site here, I'm going to show you this article. I hi highly recommend you take a look at this one. This is a really nice one. Uh, it's from a couple years back, but what it does is from Gamma Sutra. Um, it really discusses, um, you know, kind of color in games, and it's an in-depth look. I've taken excerpts from this one uh, to create this. So there's that scene that we talked about for emotion, and it talks in details about that scene, as well as how color can really change what a scene might look like. Again. Uh, you know, from, you know, from one uh, scene to the next. same scene, same texture, but adding a little bit of color grading can, can make, can go a long way to give you a look and feel that's different, right? More ominous or more technical. Uh, you know, blue colors are more conservative sometimes as well. So if you want a very conservative technical look, you might want to use more blues as an example, as opposed to greens and yellows, you know, that kind of thing. So one, a lot of times yellows and reds seem more inviting than darker colors. They seem more, they, they, see, they want you to ward you away if you see a dark color in a scene and that kind of stuff. And we can use color a lot. I know that James may have talked to you about this when you were doing anything with him with um, game design. Color is also something that we chase around. If you see a color in the screen, I was just playing uh, Medium the other day 
uh, just because I wanted to, you know, to, to see how it looked. It's more of a cinematic narrative type game. And one of the things they use a lot in medium is color. They kind of look at different scenes in, um, you know, they use they use the use of color in medium draws your eye to lead you uh, from one scene to the next, which is kind of interesting. So again, um, there's a lot of psychological things. And before, remember, all we cared about in video games when we first started off was, eh, I just want to put some graphics on the scene. And they were all kind of, um, they didn't use a lot of uh, gradients or anything like that. It was, it was literally just fully lit uh, colors when we first made uh, video games back in the day. But then we started thinking about things. We started thinking about this, you know, how much control we had of the scene. And we can really create this great cinematic effect, um, you know, with the scenes uh, that we that we manage. Remember that also, even if you make a 3D scene, as an example, and we, we apply color grading, again, as a post-processing step, right, we can do it in real time. So we can, we can take a castle that you might go to or some kind of fortress uh, that you might see in the day and you might see it at night and it might look ominous and scary compared to what it might look like during the daytime. It's really great. All right, so that's the use of color. Um, and there's some popular colors that they talk about in the same article about from 1987 to 2012 in games. So that color, the color palettes have changed from one game to the other. And for those of you uh, who don't know, uh, selecting a proper color palette for your game, whether it's 2D or 3D, is super important. And there's some great sites out there uh, that you can use. I know that probably Gavin has talked to you about this, but um, adobe.color.com, uh, right, is one of the things that I would use, color.adobe.com, uh, where you can select a color palette um, as an example for anything you want, whether it's complementary colors. Again, it's a free, uh, you can kind of get a color swatch idea, and it helps you with color selection. So take a look at uh, sites like Adobe uh, Color, which is a, kind of a free, uh, use you can also if you have access to um, uh, if you have access to Adobe uh, Creative Cloud, then you can log in and save your your swatches and all that kind of stuff for use in your games uh, or in, even in your applications. And again, there's lots of choices here in terms of the way you want these things to appear uh, in your game. So to create a uh, different effect. So this is Adobe dot color or color dot Adobe dot com. All right. Um, Jaden says, uh, yeah, we have Creative Cloud through Software Porter. And again, just as an aside, and this is kind of um, a little bit of, uh, we digress a little bit, but um, you might learn about, of course, in the uh, very soon about Mixamo, if you haven't learned about it already with from Gavin, where you can actually use uh, animated characters that are, uh, that are um, kind of um, given to you um, and mocap effects. Let me just log in here as an example. Um, mocap effects that you can see as an example oh not now uh that are are available for you free uh through adobe's mixamo so example i want i have a character and i want to apply an animation as an example you can do that and it's free and you can download that and include it in your game so really really cool yep i'm sure you did ryan and that's why i'm bringing it up but these are all really cool tools that you can use right through um uh, the uh, all the stuff that's available to you from Adobe. So really cool stuff. And one of them is color. So again, colors, uh, really, uh, they influence, they're influenced by fashion, by uh, the trend, I would say, in that particular year or years, um, you know, as we move from one year to the other. Notice that we're getting, we come from a very light, happy to more darker uh, colors. Again, as we get more technical and more realistic, there's a lot of different colors that are affecting uh, that particular year. And um, it also gives you a sense of progression. So this is, again, right from that article, which is a great article, um, where you can see that you're moving from a kind of daytime to nighttime to a scary scene, and you can add all those pieces in. And these are all the pieces of uh, the color swatches that are being used for each one of those excerpts or each, each one of those, like, um, uh, you know, kind of clips from that particular scene. Um, one thing that we have to also talk about a little bit is uh, colorblindness, because um, it, if, you're, if you're colorblind, then a lot of this is something that, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to see a lot of the colors that uh, that are available in video games. One thing I have to mention is, uh, as developers, we want to be as inclusive as possible. So including something called a colorblind mode is something that's more and more progressive and should be available in all modern games. 
right? So think about that as we move forward. We want to be inclusive to those people who um, are colorblind, and there's different ways of being colorblind. Um, for example, you can have red-green color blindness, which is probably the most uh, common color blindness. And again, um, one in 12 men, it's pretty common in men, and uh, and one in 200 women. And sometimes I, I joke around with my wife and I say, you know, honey, I can only see in 16 colors. Um, you know, and when she asked me for, does this look good? You know, kind of thing. Um, but uh, the reality is that men uh, have, they don't have, they don't see discrete colors as well in general. I'm just generalizing here, guys. As some Every man is different, right? Uh, every person, every gender is different. Um, so, you know, as an example, uh, some people see, we'll just say some people in general see uh, they, they are affected by colorblindness more than others. So we want to be able to provide, um, you know, the community uh, with different choices. One of them is, of course, an option for a female character. I think it's always good to provide an, uh, a female lead as an option. Um, to encourage more people to join our games. And the second thing is colorblind mode. There's also something called impossible colors or forbidding colors. And these are colors that we can't quite see where they're a mix of red, green. And these red, green colors come from, uh, we can only see them with special lenses like stereo 3D uh, lenses and that kind of thing. Um, so be careful about these, you know, forbidden or impossible colors to mix and match together. Um, and what it says is it's biologically impossible for the retina to see both of those colors at the same time. Okay. Jonathan says I've got blue greenish myself. I know. And a lot of people do, Jonathan. It's not just you. And that's why I think it's really important to, to include, um, to be inclusive as much as possible and plan that as an option screen in your game. All right. Um, so this is the color, uh, grading correction process. We're going to go through this part and then we're going to end for the day. Um, let's do this part. So the first step again is use a 3D texture as a lookup table. Okay. And this is going to be a 3D. Think about it as a, uh, when I say a 3D texture, a cube map, a cube map of a bunch of RGB colors. So wait, what? How do you get that? Well, there's programs out there, Photoshop specifically and um, After Effects. You can generate a cube map or a LUT, a lookup table right out of Photoshop. And what's going to happen is over the next tutorial, um, there's two parts to this, right? Generating the LUT and then loading the LUT in your game so you can use the the values that you're going to get out of the lookup table for color grading in a post-processing effect, right? So um, the great thing about Nicholas is he has prepared a couple of things. He's going to give you the LUT loader in your tutorial, so please make sure you attend the next tutorial is super important for you to do that. Um, and he's already given the tutorial, uh, the, the video, but he's going to show you how to do it and answer questions. So please, the next video that he's given you, that he's, that he's released, it all goes through this color grading process that you can go through. And he's very detailed about how you do stuff. So second step is you're going to create a screenshot of your game and you're going to insert the color cube information on the image, right? That's what you're going to do. You're going to load the screenshot in something like Photoshop, um, dot net, uh, paint.net or GIMP or something like that. And, and what it's going to do is it's going to spit out, sometimes you need to use another plugin, uh, or, or whatever. And it's going to spit out a, the color cube information that you can use to load back into your, your project. That's what you want to do. And again, the screenshot is going to be based on what the current screen looks like. And you need to do that because color grading works on every pixel in a particular position. That's why you need to get the screenshot. So you're going to sample, you're going to get a sample from the, the uh, 3D cube, right? The lookup table, 3D lookup table, the 3D texture is what you're going to do. You're going to get a sample from that and you're going to get that sample and you're going to apply it to different regions of your, um, uh, of your screen, of your texture, uh, based on the color grading that you want, light or warm or cool, as an example. So that's how you would do it. So how does it work? Um, well, basically what you have is there's, we, sometimes we, we talk about RGB, but a lot of times we also talk about, uh, HSV, which is Q, uh, saturation and value, those two things. Um, so we want to take those, a hue, which is really, um, kind of the perceived color, uh, as an example, which is, um, red, yellow, green, and blue, or a combination of two of them. And saturation is the colorfulness, uh, of, um, or similar to brightness, if you will, how much saturation there is, how much color there is 
from each of the values you've chosen, uh, you know, from uh, from the hue. You get a hue and then you saturate the hue. You add more of the color or less of the color. And you can see that as you move out, more saturation on this map looks like there's more of the color value, more of the color. And value means going from a dark to a lighter, a lighter version of the color. So that's what HSV means. Hue, you're gonna you're gonna go, you're gonna change colors. R, you know, from red, from blue into into um, you know um, uh, indigo, into red and yellow and green. That's the hue changing. And then your saturation is how much of that color, and the value is how bright that color is in terms of value. That's what values mean. All right, so. Again, this is the axis of mutual color. So that's kind of how that works. So again, hue, um, we're going to have a some kind of, uh, of object. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that object. And hue is roughly the angle of the vector to a point in the projection with red at 0 degrees, while chroma is roughly the distance of the point from the origin. Right. So that's the uh, what we're talking about here. So that's how it works. It kind of, we use this hue as well as, uh, and we take, um, we make some calculations, um, which is we take the chroma max minus chroma min, C max minus C min, the color max minus C min, and we, we, we know it as chroma, right? Uh, so how much of, uh, of the color that we have, as an example, which is, and notice that the delta, uh, the change in color from one, uh, one uh, vertex to the other, as an example, it creates this chroma value. Okay, and again, I'm not going to step into this whole equation here, uh, but what we're really doing at the end of the day, I'm just going to skip forward into this part, is we've got a set of values from a 3D cube, and we're going to look, at, you look at a lookup table, and the lookup table is going to basically replace the colors that we have in our texture with the colors that we're getting from our lookup table. That's really the essence of what we're doing. So this is in colors. So in colors might be whatever the color is, and then we're going to have some colors out based on the lookup table that we're using. Okay. Okay, I'm going to just skip through here for for this. This gives us example of volumetric properties and what it looks like. What we get when we output a lot is a dot cube file, and the dot cube file is a thing that we're going to insert or load into our game. Okay. So that's uh. That's really awesome. Okay, so that's pretty cool. And here's some examples of what a LUT loader might look like, where we look at a cube and we load it in. Uh, and you're going to see something similar uh, with Nick's video that he's got up. Thank you, Jonathan, for that. I know he's got it up. Um, and so here is how we uh, we kind of connect the the LUT and we bind. We do all our um, um, you generate the textures as an example, bind them, and we use our parameters. Um, and notice that there are different enumerations here that we're using uh, with uh, S and T, which is really the UVs of the texture, is where we're wrapping the texture and we're putting it onto uh, the scene at the, end of the, at the end of the day, right? So again, what we want to try and do is, and, and sometimes we call it color correction too. A lot of times what we want to do is we might use, instead of just using it for emotion and those kind of things we call it color correction because sometimes what we want to do is we want to change the color maybe it's too bright and we want to bring the color values down or maybe it's too dark and we want to bring the color values up we can do that uh by using um by using color color correction as a post processing step okay all right so here's the second candidate for your in class exercise number 2 so two options one of them is cell tune shading and the other option is fool around with color correction. So in this option, I've asked you to swap out the texture as an example with something else, right? And now this is a more complicated step. You may have to take this into um, Photoshop, like I said. And it might be, if you really want to challenge yourself, uh, you can try this step. Okay, so if I go to, um, you know, kind of the thing online, let's go to what I have here. Here's your color grading. And you can see what it's doing is it's changing the color grading in real time, right? That's what's happening. So take a look at this. Try and swap out the, the image so see what it looks like for you. And you can see that there's different presets uh, that they've got um, kind of that are available to you. Preset 1, 2, and 3. 
um, as you move from one uh, one kind of image to another. You can do this right through our our um, you know our shader choice. Pretty cool. So I want yeah what Andrew what I'm looking for is a, sh a screenshot before and a screenshot after is usually what I look for one or more screenshots after to kind of prove that you've kind of done it so pretty cool all right so kind of cool um, and pretty straightforward I don't think it's uh, too too crazy in terms of um, you know what you can do and I think it it depends on where your um, your interest lies if you're someone who really likes to do to work on something like color correction if it speaks to you. Do this one. If you want to do cell and tune shading, and if you feel that's really cool, do that one. All right? You don't have to do both. If you want to do both, you can, but um, you're only going to get marked for, uh, you only get values for one of them. So it's up to you. If you have time for both, I think it's great to, to do both if you can. But it's not required. Okay, so let's get back to this. So that is uh, the option that I have here. One thing I'd like you to do is there's some great uh, tutorials um, that you might have access to as well. So um, take a look at some of these things. There's some really great, uh, you know, information. And then we're going to get into one more thing, which is something called uh, multi-pass lighting and rendering. And I'm going to be talking about more of that uh, later on. All right. So again, the idea is to render the geometry to compute the lighting components individually, and then composite them at the end, like we talked about. So this is kind of like a, a uh, a recap of what we talked about. Some interesting effects that we can use are Bloom. And again, we might have different passes for Bloom. And if you actually look up what are the different passes that you need to do for Bloom, a lot of times what we want to do is first blur. I want to do some kind of blur effect. And then what I want to do is I want to take, I want to use, I want to detect some of those dark uh, areas of my picture, of my image, my texture. And I want to superimpose those uh, images or brighten the areas of the bright areas and darken the areas that are darker. And I want to oversample, if you will, uh, you know, the lighter areas of my picture. And then I layer it on top of this, uh, you know, so I blur those areas, is what I'm saying when I say oversample, and then layer it back on top of the original texture to create the bloom effect. I would say that honestly, bloom is probably overdone uh, in most video games. Sometimes we see bloom everywhere. It's like crazy how, how much we see bloom. Um, but I don't think it's a terrible effect, especially for things like, um, you know, lighting effects when it comes to weapons, weapon effects, uh, you know, glowy effects of suits. Uh, you know, everything. Bloom is just everywhere. So you can take a look at it in terms of that. HDR is also another effect. And, of course, depth of field where you play around with the, uh, with the camera. So we're going to talk more about this again another day. All right, but then what you want to do is when this multi-pass uh, lighting and rendering is the first pass is what you want to do. You want to draw some kind of uh, texture as an example, and then add some texture at two times the scale as an example. And you can keep doing that. This is an example of multi-pass uh, lighting and rendering. And then what you have at the end is a final texture uh, that you add. And so you compose a texture just like this with several passes. Okay, finally, uh, the, the one thing I want to talk about here is um, the effects of jittering and dithering. Um, a lot of times what we want to use is you want to add noise to reduce uh, different visible artifacts, such as banding. So this is an example of banding. And what we can do is we can use, um, you know, a dithered surface. Notice that if I zoom in here, dithering looks like it, it's like uh, pixelation. If I, if I want to do kind of like, um, you know, kind of a, I want to use some kind of a... Uh, you know, a, um, a kind of a pixelated surface. I want to kind of put little little dots in there and I, and I use pixelation on that. So that's a dithering, dithering. And then, um, you know, uh, if you have something like, uh, you know, kind of a gradient, a gradient kind of basically smooths out the banding that we see here to create a much nicer effect. So those are other things that we can use. All right, so that is really our talk on... Um, that is really our talk on post-processing and color correction. I'm just going to go back up to the top to recap the stuff that's due. So again, due by the end of the week, that's Friday, is in-class exercise two. Choose a tune cell shader or something. Uh, and it's, one of, it's up to you. You don't have to choose the ones that I gave you. You can choose um, whichever ones you want that makes sense for you. All right. Um, Fardine says, uh, do we have to implement tune shading or color grading on separate shader found? No, you can. Choose one that makes sense for you, one, uh, you know, on Shader Toy, okay? One or the other. 
That's due Friday. The other one, assignment two, remember that that is due on Sunday this week. And you need to, if you haven't had a chance to already, guys, some people have not signed up for groups. Please do not leave today without having a chance to talk to some group members from your GDW team or your non-GDW team. Uh, and again, I also have one student who is working alone because he doesn't have a GDW team. But um, for for everyone, please sign up for a group, even if you're a group of one. It's important that you sign up for a group where you cannot submit your assignment. It'll be the same process for assignment three and assignment four. And assignment three, like I said, and I've detailed the uh, uh, everything about assignment three today, it's due week seven. Okay, so those things that are due today. Also, next week, please be aware one more time. I'm saying at the beginning of the ending of, of the, the lecture, so maybe you catch it at the end or see it at the, at the beginning. I'm just repeating myself again that we do have a midterm test that's due next week. It's going to be practical. And I'm gonna, it's going to be based on assignment one and assignment two and the tutorials that you've had with Nick. So um, you're going to be given some kind of template and you're going to be asked to modify the template from there. It could be as, as simple as here's Otter. You already know how to do Otter. Apply some of the things that we've asked you to do with an effect that we haven't asked you to do so far. Something else. All right. That we haven't asked you to do. Well, you can definitely use something that we've given you as a base. And I'll, I'll provide all the details to you. Uh, as an example, early in the week. Jaden asks, only one group member will be handing it in, correct? Yes, because if you're part of a group, then any one of you can submit and um, they'll submit for the entire team. Any other questions? Cool, thanks. I want to stop recording this now. So for the people who are watching live on YouTube, thank you so much. Um, I will see you guys. Uh, again, one thing we're, we're going to do is next week when it comes to uh, YouTube video, I'm not going to produce a YouTube video next week because um, uh, just one second, uh, Aaron, um, because there's no lecture next week, but we are going to meet next week during this time frame. Okay, so I'm not going to, please don't uh, skip class. It might be good if you come in and ask your questions. I might have uh, I'm, I will be able to clarify your questions on Wednesday of next week, and I'm sure you're going to have them based on the on the midterm assignment that you're going to get earlier that week. All right, so make sure you attend the lecture next week and the tutorial, uh, which is going to also help you with finishing off your practical test. All right, that's it for me, though. I'm going to sign off from YouTube, and I'll take questions locally for people who are here um, on Zoom. Thank you for that, and I'll see you next uh, next week or the or after next week again. Uh, after midterm, we're into uh, our our uh, study break. And so the next lecture is going to be checkpoint two. I guess Josh also mentioned that too. Checkpoint two is coming around the corner. And that is just after study break. I'm going to meet with all the teams again, right, in checkpoint number two. And the first part of shadow mapping, we're going to be talking about week six. All right. Um, but we're going to continue to talk shadow mapping into week seven. So again, when we come back from our midterm, our mid semester break, we're going to get right into checkpoint two. I'm going to send you some announcements to remind you as we get closer. Guys, thank you so much for the people who are watching online. I'm going to take questions now for people that are here in class. Thank you.